My name is Lois Broad. I was Lois Johnson before I was married. I was the fifth in my family, and it was an afterthought. My father was 58 when I was born, my mother was 42. There weren't the helicopter parents there are now. My mother let me out of the house. My mother didn't know where I was. She couldn't have cared less. I learned all my sex education on the next street. And when I was born in 1927, we lived at 292 Evelyn Avenue, which was up near St. John's Road. And uh, then when I was seven months old, my brother, who was 16, died of heart failure, of heart problems, and they didn't want to stay in that house. So when I was nine months old, we moved to 107 High Park Avenue, which is at the northeast corner of Glen Lake and High Park. And my father taught at Humberside, so he just walked to, to work a block. When I went to kindergarten, I had to cross Glen Lake, Pacific, Oak Mount, and Mount View to Keel. I went to Keel Street Public School. So my mother had the girl at the corner who was in grade eight walk me to school, to kindergarten. Well, this girl would push me onto the road and then say, why are you walking on the road? And so I told my mother. So my mother didn't suggest that she would take me. She said, okay, walk by yourself. So I walked by myself to Kill Street School. No problem. Not like today when I kind of get out of my driveway for SUVs taking their kids to school. It's ridiculous. I went by myself sleigh riding. My mother didn't take me. I went by myself. And then, of course, I would stay too long and go home crying with the cold. <laughs> I'd go back the next day and do the same thing and go home crying and then never learned. <laughs> what we experienced when I was a kid was all the delivery trucks that were in the area. Eaton's and Simpson's delivered every single day. Eaton's and Simpson's had two pages of ads in every evening paper and they would be yay big, a picture of a blouse, for instance, with the sizes and the price and the COD number that you phoned and ordered a size 14 in blue. And the next day, the Eaton's truck would deliver COD. And so you had the Eaton's truck, you had the Simpson's truck, you had the ice truck. Oh, that was fun because we only had ice boxes. We didn't have refrigerators. So the, the ice man had to chip a cube of ice that would fit into that refrigerator. And then the kids could suck up the chips. That was fun. And then the bread man, uh, coal trucks, milk wagon. Well, the story is that the milk wagon guy sometimes went into houses, right? <laughs> Your kid better look like me, not the milkman, right? <laughs> so there was a house on our block that the milkman visited. <laughs> I had a little boyfriend that lived in the Keyhole House on High Park Avenue, and uh, the lady next door to me on Glen Lake put her milk bottles out on the porch. She didn't have a milk box. Most of us had a milk box, but she didn't, so she put her bottles out on the porch. But David peed in them. <laughs> she got so mad. <laughs> So those are my early memories. <laughs> we had the peanut man. He was fun. The, the man that was in our area, maybe, maybe everywhere, I don't know, had a monkey on a string that would keep, bring the kids out and then they would buy the popcorn. So there was all sorts of traffic, shall we say. And then the horses that were drawn by these knew exactly where to stop without being told where to stop. They got to know the route. But with the horses, there were horse balls, right? You know what horse balls are. <laughs> and there was, a mis there was a Mr. Love in my neighborhood, a retired gentleman, <laughs> that used to play hockey with his cane with the horse balls. <laughs> that was life in those days. When we went shopping, we could go up Dundas or down Bloor. Why we said that, I don't know. Up Dundas was the A&P, Loblaws, Power Grocerya. You went to a counter and you told the, the person what you wanted and then they went and got it for you. There were butcher shops, there were two florists, 
There was a funeral parlor, Woolworths and Krasny's huge stores side by side. And Woolworths particularly had a long lunch counter. And apparently that was extremely lucrative for Woolworths. The Alps restaurant was, was a Chinese restaurant. Taylor Shoes was there. A lot of women's dress shops and fruit markets. Indovinos was one of the Italians, and Lums was a Chinese store. And I remember being sent up to the butcher shop and told to buy the center cut of the cross rib roast. That was my, what I had to do. <laughs> the Runnymede Theater was very important to us. They had a Saturday matinee for the kids. So for, a, I think it was a dime, maybe it was a, a nickel when we started that you go to the Sunday, Saturday matinee, and it was so popular, it would have been lying right around the block waiting to get in. And uh, the, the, there was a doorman who was dressed in a scarlet uh, jacket with gold braid and a, and a hat, and he was a handsome, gray-haired gentleman. And then in the ticket booth was a woman with her curls on top of her head, highly made up. Then on the Saturday matinee, <laughs> The kids were so raucous, they had a matron walk up and down the aisle in a white coat trying to keep order. <laughs> now, my husband's family sent him every Saturday to get rid of him, I guess. <laughs> but my mother would only let me go to Shirley Temple movies, because that was all she would allow me to go to. But anyway, I don't know whether you know it, but the Runnymede Theater had a projection in the ceiling that it looked up, when you looked up, airplanes were crossing the ceiling. It was one of the very few places that had that. It was miraculous. Just a wonderful place. These are beautiful items. What they are is what were given out by the Runnymede Theater during the Depression and certain, I don't know whether certain days or certain evenings, if you went to the theater, you got a prize. These are very lovely things, and I still use them, have them in my home. Uh, during the Depression, um, my family wasn't affected as m uh, many other people were because my father was a teacher. Now, I had one friend, uh, they lived on Pacific, and her father was a coal man. And uh, he would, had a truck, and he would have a burlap sack of coal over his shoulder, he would walk up to your house and then the cellar window was open and he dumped it into the cellar window to where you kept your coal. And he, he came home covered in coal dust every night, of course. Now, they lived with her gra his grandparents because they had to move in together. So a lot of families did that. But my friend had two sisters and one brother. And the one brother, I guess, had his own room, but the three girls slept in the same double bed right through high school. <laughs> no kids would do that today, but that's what they had to do. That was the Depression. And also during the Depression, there were men around that were unemployed, that, that needed food. My mother would make a lunch for them and have them sit to have their lunch or their dinner or whatever. My mother and I were up in the butcher shop one day, this is during the Depression, and some little kids came in and asked for bones, just bones, which were free. So my mother looked and thought there's a problem here. So she took them home with the bones and we went to someplace up above St. Clair, off Kiel, and there was a, a man that had been damaged in the war, the First World War, and they were penniless and they were living on bones, making soup from bones. So my mother took them under her wing for quite a number of years. Uh, but that's, that's what happened in those days. High Park United Church was like a block above us, on the corner of uh, Annette and High Park. My parents, incidentally, were the first people married in that building in 1909. We went there to, to Sunday service in the morning. Then when we, were, we went to Sunday school in the afternoon. And when we were old enough, like teenagers, we went at night. We went to church three times a day. 
but that was the social center of the whole community. Now, there was a young man that ran a, a, a boys' Sunday school class okay. Sunday afternoon, and there was a wonderful uh, gym in the basement. So he ran a, this Sunday school class, plus he had floor hockey on Wednesday nights, okay? But if you want to play floor hockey, regardless of your denomination, you had to go to his Sunday school. When I was going there, that Sunday school was the largest Sunday school in the British Empire. That's how big it was. So we went morning, afternoon, and night. In the summer, the minis was the, the most attractive place for the kids to go. There were two huge pools. It was so popular that in, on a Saturday or Sunday, you could not see the water for the people in it. And my mother wouldn't let me go because I might catch a, an infection. But it was very, very popular. And the man that owned it was Dr. McCormick, and he owned Strathcona House. And it was originally the home of the mayor of West Toronto Junction. Now, when Dr. McCormick had it, he had a clinic in there of some kind. It had been a maternity hospital, which was terrible because it wasn't soundproofed at all. There was no soundproofing in this place. Can you imagine? Anyway, the minis, uh, Dr. McCormick even brought in tons of sand to make a beach. Oh, it was something, I'm telling you, it really was. But then it disappeared when the, sub when the subway went through. Well, a lot of the times when uh, we, we, we had dances at school, at Humberside, we had a, sp a fall dance, we had a spring dance, we had a, a formal. But I had, I had lots of boyfriends, but I very quickly settled on my husband. My first date with my husband, I was 14, he was 15. So he lived in Quebec, I lived on High Park. In the summer, we would walk along Bloor to Parkside, down Parkside to Sunnyside. We would walk around the Sunnyside. We might go on one ride. We might have one drink of honeydew. Do you remember honeydew? And then go home. It was a really cheap date, but it was fun. And the Palais Royal was a very popular dance place. Bert Naoshi's big band was there for years and years and years. There was a sea breeze, which is an open air dance floor, weather permitting, of course, but it was outdoors, nothing above. The Palace Pier uh, would bring in big bands. Now, one thing I, one of them I particularly remember was seeing Doris Day there. Doris Day was singing with Les Brown, the band of renown, at the Palace Pier. And she was cute. She was probably only 18 at the time. She had a very demure navy blue crepe dress with a little white Peter Pan collar. And she was very slim, but she knew what she would do. She turned around and her little back tie just stuck out a little bit. <laughs> Sunnyside was wonderful. It's just too bad it died. When we were kids, there was no booze anywhere. There were beer parlors that ladies went in one door and men went in the other. And I graduated in 49 from university. I think it was about the last year cocktail bars opened. The junction had um, what they call local option and they always voted against letting liquor in. My father-in-law who ended up in the hospital one time for detox always voted against it. He didn't want a cocktail bar next to his house. He, he drank a lot, but he didn't want that. So the junction went down when the booze went up in other areas of the city. Nobody wanted to frequent the junction because there was no, no booze there. So it really deteriorated, and that was a bad time for the junction. And it's only coming back now because there's bars there now. So that's the way that affected that area. So we had a big living room, 
<laughs> and my sisters would be, there was four corners in the room, right? So the three sisters were each in a corner in a Chesterfield or love seat with their boyfriends, and I was in the other corner by the window, and all the lights were out, so I was on guard to see when my parents were walking down the street so I could turn the lights on. <laughs> it was fun. I learned a lot when I was a young kid. <laughs> mm -hmm.